Step 3. Properties of coherent states. Now that we have derived what the form of the coherent state is in terms of the number basis, let's derive some of its fundamental properties. One of the first questions that one can ask is, are two different coherent states orthogonal? We know that number states are orthogonal. When you take the inner product between two different number states n and m, then you get a zero. But if you take the inner product between n and n, you get one. Let's see what's the case for coherent states. So what we do, we write down the inner product between two different coherent states, alpha and beta. When we uh, write it down as a double sum, we'll obtain the following expression. We've got the normalization factors over here for alpha and for beta, and then we've got a double sum going from zero all the way to infinity for both indices n and m. And then we've got this fraction over here. We've got beta conjugate, because beta is in general a um, complex number, to the power of n divided by square root of n factorial, and we've got the same for alpha. Alpha to the power of m divided by square root of m factorial, and then the inner product of the two number states, n and m. So we know that is equal to delta nm. So substituting that in, we simplify our double sum into a single sum, and we obtain the following expression. We've got the same normalization factor as before, and then we've got a single sum going from n equals to 0 to infinity of the following product. We've got the conjugate of beta times alpha, whole thing squared uh, to the power of n, divided by n factorial. Now we do a little bit of algebra, which we're going to skip, and we're going to show you the final, um, final expression. This, this is it. The inner product between two coherent states, alpha and beta, is given by this following expression. We've got some first exponential times the second one. So let's look at this one. Beta and alpha are complex numbers. Therefore, their product is a complex number. But here we can see that we're taking the difference between beta conjugate times alpha and beta times alpha conjugate. So the conjugate of this product is given by this product. In other words, it's a pure imaginary number. So this first exponential really is just e to the power of some pure imaginary, which is just a phase. Remember, inner product here can be complex because alpha and beta have complex eigenvalues. And then we've got the second exponential. Now this one is a real number because we're taking the modulus of the difference between beta and alpha squared divided by 2. So we can see that the whole expression is not equal to 0. In other words, two coherent states are not orthogonal. This is in contrast to number states or many other states that we have seen before. For coherent states, they are never fully orthogonal. You can think about what happens when you vary this alpha and beta. When the two states are close to each other, in other words, beta and alpha are very, uh, uh, very close to each other in terms of their modulus, the difference of the modulus, uh, the modulus of the difference, then you can see that this inner product is appreciable and they've got quite a large overlap. But if you've got two very different complex numbers, then this overlap goes exponentially to zero. So for two very different uh, complex numbers, you, we can say that they are nearly orthogonal, but they're never fully orthogonal. Now, how about the fluctuations of the position and momentum operators, but for coherent states? We have seen what happens to fluctuations when you compare them, when we calculate them with respect to vacuum or single photon state or any n, uh, n photon state. Let's see what's the case when we consider coherent states. To remind you, here are our position and momentum operators expressed in terms of the creation and annihilation operators for a single mode. And what we're interested in is calculating the first and second moment of each operator. In other words, we want to calculate the average of q with respect to alpha, the coherent state, and also the average of q squared, the second moment. So let's begin with the average of q. We're going to sandwich this a between two uh, coherent states denoted by alpha. We know that the coherent state is an eigenstate of the annihilation operator. So A acting on uh, coherent state alpha just gives us the number alpha times alpha, uh, coherent state alpha itself. So in here, we will have 
uh, computing the average with respect to uh, coherent states, we will get alpha plus alpha conjugate, meaning we're going to get two times the real part of alpha. So substituting that in and canceling the twos, bring the two to the uh, no numerator, we get square root of two times h bar times the real part of alpha as our average of the position operator. Similarly, we can do the math uh, by considering alpha, uh, sorry, q squared. We have to expand this term by squaring it, and what we get is the following. That the average of the second moment of q is 2 h bar times the square of the real part of alpha, plus this extra term over here, h bar divided by 2. And that term appears because a and a dagger do not commute, and their commutator is equal to 1. So, using these two moments, we can now compute the fluctuation of q. In other words, we compute the standard deviation. So we take average of q squared minus the average of q squared, and we get the following. We see that these two terms will cancel upon squaring this average of q, and all we are left with is this h bar over 2, and we have to take the square root. That's our fluctuation for q. Similarly, computing the fluctuation for the momentum operator, p, follows the same lines. And in fact, is equal also to square root of h bar over 2. So multiplying them together now, we get that delta q times delta p is equal to h bar over 2. In other words, these fluctuations saturate the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, meaning that a coherent state is also a minimum uncertainty state. We have seen examples of a minimum uncertainty state in previous lessons, namely the vacuum of a single quantum mode. But we saw that if we consider single photon modes or uh, multiple photons in a single mode, their fluctuations increase with the number of photons in the mode. This is not true for coherent state. Any coherent state, regardless of the magnitude of its complex eigenvalue alpha, satisfy the minimum uncertainty relations. Now we will describe how to, represent, um, how to represent coherent states in a very suggestive and useful way. We call this the phase space representation of coherent states. And in order to see how it works, we're going to define two new operators. They are called the position quadrature and the momentum quadrature, denoted by x1 hat and x2 hat respectively. Really what we, you can see that x1 is just the rescaled version of our position operator from the previous slide. And the momentum quadrature is just the rescaled version of our momentum uh, operator from the previous slide. Also notice that x1 and x2 are dimensionless. Now when we compute the average of x1 with respect to a coherent state alpha, we see that that is equal to uh, a real part of alpha. Also the average of x2 with respect to alpha gives us the imaginary part of alpha. Also, we can compute the fluctuations in x1, and that's just given by a half, and equally for x2, the fl uh, whose fluctuations are also one half. So this property, that the averages of x1 and x2 are just the real parts of alpha and the imaginary parts of alpha, allows us to think of coherent states as just points in an argon diagram. So let's see how that looks. We've got our plane, our argon diagram, where on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, we're plotting the average of x1, which is the real part of alpha. And on the vert vertical axis, we've got the average of x2, the position quadrature, which corresponds to the imaginary part of alpha. So let's say that we pick a coherent state denoted by ket alpha over here. That is represented by this point over here with coordinates real part of alpha and imaginary part of alpha. But also we want to uh, remind ourselves that coherent states have some fluctuations associated with them. In other words, the values of x1 and x2 are never sharp. So we represent this by this following circle. And we say that the size of this circle for a coherent state corresponds to the fluctuations dx1, which is a half, and dx2, which is also a half. So let's say we take a different coherent state given by the complex amplitude beta. Then we just see what are the real parts and imaginary parts of beta, and we plot it accordingly, and again using the same circle to represent the fluctuations in 
uh, position and momentum quadratures. So what happens when alpha is zero? Well, we just plot it in the middle of our argon diagram at the origin, and in fact, this state is our vacuum state. Now you see why we previous, in previous lessons we uh, obtained the result that the vacuum is a minimum uncertainty relation. In fact, the vacuum zero, which we were considering in the context of number states, is a special coherent state where alpha is equal to zero. Therefore, it makes sense that it's minimum, that it's also a minimum uncertainty relation. Uh, in minimum uncertainty state. So this concludes our basic discussion of coherent states. Now we're going to take this uh, phase space representation of coherent states and play around with the uncertainties, and this will lead us to the notion of squeezed states. See you in the next step.